1873, the losing side of the Louisiana gubernatorial election took up arms and marched on a small town of Colfax, sparking a race massacre. White supremacists, including members of the Ku Klux Klan and former Confederate soldiers, marched on the courthouse defended by black Republicans, firing a cannon and killing nearly 200 black people. The massacre spread beyond the courthouse, and white authorities refused to prosecute the murderers. The Supreme Court overturned the convictions of the few perpetrators, ending the federal government's ability to fight hate crimes against black Americans. In the 2000s, Colfax residents still blamed black Louisianans for getting uppity. In 2021, Colfax finally removed the historic marker outside the courthouse, but the massacre had wide-reaching consequences that continue to this day. Of the 150 black men that were slain, more than half of them were slaughtered in cold blood, while just three members of the White League were killed. It should be duly noted that the League was a democratic organization, and noted again that the Democrats have not always been liberal supporters of black causes. Two laws that Southern Democrats hated were the 14th and 15th Amendments. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship to blacks and declared that no state was to deprive them of life, liberty, or property. The 15th Amendment prevented a state from denying the vote to any person because of their race. Together, these laws guaranteed blacks equal citizenship and the good people of Colfax just weren't having it on Easter Sunday of 1873. After the Colfax massacre, the federal government convicted three whites for the murders. But as fate would have it, they were freed when the U.S. Supreme Court declared that they had been convicted unconstitutionally. The resulting white and black clash stemmed from the defeat of the Democrats for the 1872 governor of Louisiana. On April 13th, 300 armed white men, including members of the white supremacist organization, the Knights of the White Camellia, and the Ku Klux Klan, attacked the courthouse building. When they maneuvered a cannon to fire at the courthouse, 60 black defenders fled while others surrendered. James Hadnot was accidentally shot by one of his own men. The white militia responded by shooting all the prisoners. The white mob went on to kill African Americans who had nothing to do with the event, and it continued through the night. After the dust settled, 150 African Americans were killed, including 48 after the battle. Three whites were killed and a few others injured. Even the total number of blacks are unconfirmed due to their bodies being dumped into the Red River and some secretly buried. 97 white militiamen were arrested and charged after New Orleans police and federal troops restored order. A handful of them were convicted, but were released in 1875 when Supreme Court ruled the Enforcement Act, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, was unconstitutional. Here's something to think about. How is it that during the 90 years from the end of Reconstruction to the 1960s, thousands of black people in the South could be publicly lynched and the federal government not lift a finger to stop the lynchings or punish the perpetrators. It's not like they didn't know what was happening. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, has to date documented 4,400 racial terror lynchings between 1877 and 1950. Historical records show that in 1893, for instance, one lynching occurred in the South every 40 hours and the count is ongoing. But how were these murders documented? Most of them were announced in advance in local newspapers, openly and proudly. And then, of course, there were the postcards, sold and collected throughout the country so widely that the U.S. Post Office finally tried to ban them in 1908. But did the federal government do anything to stop the century-long reign of terror? Not a chance. Why? There is an answer, and to find it, you need only travel back in time to the years following the Civil War known as Reconstruction and the tiny town of Colfax, deep in the heart of Louisiana.
and from there head on over to the United States Supreme Court, whose landmark 1876 decision gave the seal of approval to a reign of terror in the South that lasted nearly a century. This was a unique moment in American history when laws and constitutional amendments were passed granting former slaves the democratic rights of citizenship. As Bob Avakian describes it, quote, during the brief period of reconstruction, while the full promise of these rights was never realized, there were significant changes and improvements in the lives of black people in the South. The right to vote and to hold office and some of the other constitutional rights that are supposed to apply to citizens of the U.S. were partly, if not fully, realized by the former slaves during Reconstruction. And in fact, some black people were elected to high office, though never the highest office of governor in a number of southern states. End quote. Along with those rights, laws were passed that made racist terror a federal crime. But from day one, those laws, fought by former slave owners, Confederate veterans, and a significant number of white people in the South were rarely enforced. In Louisiana, which had been the most brutal of slave states, estimates are that over a thousand black people were murdered in racist terror attacks during the four years between 1868 and 1872. Then came the sharply contested 1872 election for governor of Louisiana, won by William Pitt Kellogg, a supporter of Reconstruction. Following his victory, a mob, led by the white supremacist Crescent City White League, stormed and occupied the State House in New Orleans, attempting to overthrow the election. Is this starting to sound familiar? Knowing what was coming, African Americans in Colfax, which was the seat of Grant Parish in central Louisiana, took refuge in the courthouse. Then on April 13th, Easter Sunday, they were set upon by 300 White League and KKK members armed with rifles and a cannon. Following a brief gun battle, the freemen surrendered. Historian Tom Army describes what happened next. The attackers lined up those who surrendered outside the courthouse and then called each freedman out of line by name. As they came forward, they were shot. Some had their throats slit. The remainder were hanged. 165 freedmen were either killed in the fight or executed. Three white men were killed in the attack. Historian Eric Foner described the Colfax massacre as, quote, the bloodiest single instance of racial carnage in the Reconstruction era. End quote. When no state charges were brought against the murderers, the federal government tried nine of them under the new civil rights laws with, quote, interfering with people's right and privilege to peaceably assemble together, end quote. Only three were convicted, and the case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court in 1875. The case was the United States versus Cruikshank. And in March of 1876, the court threw out the convictions of the three murderers on the grounds that the Bill of Rights only protects black people from violations of their rights committed by the federal or state government, not by racist mobs. You heard that right. The United States Supreme Court declared the federal government had no jurisdiction over racist mobs committing mass murder. And with that... The civil rights laws and amendments of the past 10 years were essentially nullified, and the historic attempt by the federal government to grant democratic rights to black people was over. By 1877, the army was withdrawn from every one of the southern states, and white supremacy was free to rule by terror and murder for decades to come. Truth be told, the complete emancipation and integration of black people into American life was never really the goal of Reconstruction. After all, who would pick the cotton that was so central to the growth of capitalism if the millions of formerly enslaved people were truly free? So sharecropping, essentially a slavery under a new name, became the order of the day. As Bob Avakin explains, quote, 
Real freedom for the former slaves would have enabled them to resist the severe exploitation that was visited upon them, and thus would have made the reintegration of the southern economy into the larger society much less profitable for the ruling capitalists. So the Ku Klux Klan was unleashed in full force and played a brutal role in defeating and subjugating the freed slaves and progressive whites, often in bloody battles. End quote. And besides, as capitalism flourished and the newly united country expanded west, the army had other needs to tend to. <laughs> 